Uh, next week is spring break, so we have um, another break again. So it's kind of a nice uh, little little cushion here as we go into this last uh, portion of the semester. Um, I just want to cover our remote guidelines and also for Karen to be aware that you guys will use the raise your hand button if you want to speak and I'll call on you in order and make sure to type your immediate questions in the chat function and please, please, please turn on your camera if you're going to speak so that we can um, have a nice, comfortable dialogue with you guys and also unmute only when you're beginning to speak. As a reminder, all classes are recorded. Um, this one's already being recorded and all are posted to YouTube after class. Um, you guys have been doing a great job on your lecture prep questions. Just a reminder that these are all, you need to do two of them before the end of the semester. Um, and the last lecture is on May 10th, so make sure you're planning accordingly. Other than this, uh, there's only the final left this semester and, and participation in attendance. So uh, make sure you're plugging along. Uh, social media, just a quick flash of the accounts that uh, correlate with this class. There was a extra credit on uh, Instagram this week and only one student in the entire class participated. So uh, I don't feel like people are necessarily following along, but it's a great place to be to, to catch some extra credit points. Quick flash of our schedule. As you all know, we have Karen Sabag here today, who's a designer for Karen Sabag New York, uh, Bridal Wear and Couture. It's going to be a really fun conversation. Next week, spring break. And then we have two amazing designers coming in the following weeks. On week nine, it's Zeta Musa, um, who is a design director for Betsy Johnson Kids. The following week is Demetra Williams, who is a, an alum of FIT, like Karen, and uh, has founded a company called Mitra, and she also works as a designer at Helmut Lang. The next week, we take a little look at beauty from the perspective of Bijou Abiola, who's the director of consumer insights and strategy for L'Oreal. And week 12, Alana Botez will be joining us. She is a costume designer, but as opposed to uh, who we've already met this semester, she is more on the theater side of things. So she can give a really great perspective on, on that from a very artistic lens. Uh, Rachel Landy will be joining us the following week. She's vice president of global merchandising at Kate Spade. And we will round out our lectures, as I mentioned before, on May 10th with Fashion Service Network which will be a panelist, a panel of different people who kind of support the industry in different ways. Any questions on schedule before I move forward? Okay, great. Well, bridal wear industry is a really exciting uh, sliver of the industry and it's growing hand over fist. I think obviously 2020 being a little bit of a blip given so many events were canceled, but I feel like 2021 is going to come back with a vengeance and we're going to see so much growth in this in the coming years. In 2015, more than 2.1 million couples were married at an average cost of 32.6k a wedding, which is really a significant amount of money that gets poured into this industry. And wedding dresses are a very top priority for people uh, on average spending about $1,500 on a dress. Typically uh, dominated by higher end dressing, uh, this industry in general. And mainstream designers have taken a stab in recent years with a little bit of a rise from J. Crew, Anthropology, and Taylor, among others. Uh, and a new sustainable trend has been emerging here with lending and borrowing. Um, and you'll, we'll speak to Karen a little bit about her side of things, but also I think the fact that a lot of uh, bridal dresses are cut to order and made to order kind of prevents a lot of waste that you see in the other parts of the industry. Uh, bridal accessories, shrugs, jackets, and short dresses are also increasing in popularity. And this is another thing I'm excited to ch chat with Karen about as I know she has a new venture uh, that's a little bit more casual than her stunning couture bridal wear dresses. So with that, I'd love to introduce you guys to Karen. Uh, born to a creative family of couturiers, Karen Sabag discovered her passion for creativity at a young age. She began designing her own pieces at home under the careful guidance of her mother. She later went on to study and graduate from FIT in 2005. Throughout those years, she was awarded first place in Kleinfeld's bridal design competition in 2007 from over 800 entrants, and then went on to open her Brooklyn boutique, boutique for made to order bridal gowns, evening wear, and cocktail dresses. With an overwhelming amount of success, she pursued her dreams and opened her se second boutique in Manhasset, March 2013. 
Her sensibility of the female form and ability to create elegant, modern, and timeless pieces brought success to the Karen Sabag Atelier, having her pieces appeal to all generations. With her mother by her side, Karen oversees all creations, having each piece combined with the finest materials, unrivaled craftsmanship, and most importantly, the creative vision of Karen herself. So please join me in welcoming Karen to our class. Are you there? <laughs> oh, did I lose her? Oh, there you are. Can't hear you. There you are. Okay. How are you? Nice yeah. Hi. Great. Great to have you. To have, thank you for having me. <laughs> Hope you're doing well. Um, it's kicking off busy season now. I bet. I can imagine. Probably quite a few engagements coming out of this winter. <laughs> well, now that New York uh, guidelines, you're allowed to have 150 people. Yeah. Um, last week was the first week, right? Back. Yeah. Last week was back. So it's been picking up. Super exciting. <laughs> That's cool. Well, I would love for you to just kick off by telling the students a little bit about how you have gotten to where you are. Um, so graduating from FIT. Um, and like what you said, like I grew up in the industry and then opened my first, I knew exactly what we want, wanted to do with special occasion. Um, I think it's very important to know what field you want to be in, especially if you're in the fashion design program, um, yeah. not be all over the place. So I think the first thing that everybody should know is where they want to be. Um, and then me being in the special occasion, um, bridal wear, I think I already knew going towards that i went straight into kleinfeld um and then fashion shows and that's how i started every season and you know it doesn't it sounds easy but it's not as easy as it sounds <laughs> it's a lot of hours and um a lot of responsibilities especially in this industry it doesn't sound easy to me <laughs> <laughs> um so can you tell us a bit about your time at fit um, I went to FIT for four years. I graduated. Um, I loved it. I learned a lot, um, from the, especially from the business aspect of it that I didn't learn from home. Um, I loved a lot of the professors. I feel like they were very helpful. Um, I'm sure now with COVID, it's a little hard. Um, you know, I have some interns that, you know, have, can go in to do some work or not allowed or allowed. And um, it's very hard for them, so I try to help some of them as much as I can um, to understand. Yeah. You know, the sewing is, I think sewing is probably the hardest if you can't be in school. Um, totally. Yeah. But I, I loved FIT. I think it was an experience, and I, it's part of my journey and that I'm always thankful for. Yeah. Um, I mentioned when I read your bio about the uh, contest that you entered for Kleinfeld's. Was there anything else that you did while you were at FIT that you would recommend? Um, well, I wasn't a contest person. I didn't like contests. <laughs> I, um, you know, I knew what I liked and I knew what I wanted to do. So, but graduating and I had professor, I don't think he's there anymore, Professor Cruz. Um, I think he retired two years ago. So, and he's like, if you don't get into this because you never entered one in FIT, you are not graduating. <laughs> and I said, I have to enter this contest to graduate. And then I ended up, ended up winning, and then I ended up selling there for like five years, I would say. And then I stopped. So cool. yeah, I, was, I liked it, but I, I didn't like the whole um, wholesale market. I liked knowing who the bride was and, you know, doing the couture is what I so Yeah. That, second location in Manhasset. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, so can you can you tell us how your biggest piece of advice to students to maximize their time while they're at FIT? Um, again, I think knowing what you want to be in, like what like specific area you want to design it, whether it's bridal wear or swimwear or um, ready to wear or knit wear. Um, I think it's very important to know what field you want to be in because there's such different fields that different markets also, different markets, different fields, different shows, um, fabrics. So I think it's very important to know where you want to go 
um, coming out of college and knowing where you want to start interning and, you know, designing from there. Yeah, that's, that's good advice. Now you obviously growing up in the industry, do you want to actually, do you want to tell them a little bit about what your mother did and how you um, became interested? We still work together. Like we're still one brand now. Um, oh, cool. so I grew up knowing like couture, like I grew up being pinned at and like being, you know, sewn on and like, like that's where I grew up knowing. And I think, um, seeing like I didn't like doing simple if that makes sense so like just pants or shirt to me was boring so I think that's why I liked it even more because you could go there's a lot more detail and a lot more um beading and beautiful fabrics like luxury fabrics mm -hmm. that I loved um working with and that's really a lot what inspires me is like fabrication from all over the world um through all my collections and I think um growing up with beauty, I think made me want to be in it. And, you know, since I graduated, we branched into one brand, me and my mom, and then it became Karen Sabag, New York. That's great. <laughs> um, do, you, uh, do you have any friends who maybe didn't grow up in the industry, but went to FIT with you, you know, like that they have passed along advice to you on how they got out there and got going? Um, I know that's been so when I graduated, I think it was a little bit hard to get jobs in the industry. Um, the market wasn't, you know, it depends where you want it to be. So one of my friends went into um, custom, like, but I want to say, like, she was doing all the Halloween costumes for, like, everything. That's cool. Fine up for a long time. And, like, and she still did it till about, like, three years ago. And that's the field she was in, was in custom design. And she yeah. loved this Broadway and like, you know, and I always said to her, I'm like, if I do evening, that would be my next thing is costume design. That seemed like it'd be really fun. <laughs> yeah, it looks fun. The ballet clothes and all that. So it looks fun. Totally. Although it's so price sensitive, I feel like you'd probably be so like constricted, especially after what you do. Yeah, but that's why I said I would do like roadway <laughs> I wouldn't go into Halloween <laughs> I love it that's great on Broadway or in the movies <laughs> yeah that'd be really cool mm -hmm. uh, how how did you get started how did you find your first shop and kind of get off the ground I think a lot with the help of my mom um that my shop in Brooklyn was hers and then that's where I interned when I was in FIT. I went, I was interning in her office. And we just, once I graduated and like I did fashion week, um, then we said, okay, it has to be like a Karen's Bob Atelier, let's turn it around. And we got the LCC and, um, and I was like about six months to people know where their first store was. Um, the production that we did, everything was in house. Um, nothing is out of state. Everything was made in New York till today. Um, so cool. And Kleinfeld was a big help also because that was like another push in the industry, in the bridal industry, that people knew of me, whether it was from magazines or um, photo shoots or different things that um, you know that needed in the industry for bridal that I was working with, and I think having a store in Brooklyn, having like a location, I think helped me grow a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, what do you feel like is the hardest part of running your own company these days? Um, hours. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like it's not enough time. Um, there's just, it's a lot. Like I have three kids at home. So, and then I just lounge another, you know, my, another, thing in my industry that I did now and I'm looking to open another location in Miami so it's like it's a lot, a lot going yeah on. like just being in a schedule I think it's the hardest part like if if you're and there's no or can be organized like especially in fashion like I as much as I can my husband says you're always never organized I'm like well I can't there's always something comes in if it's a last minute photo shoot or like a stylist needs a dress or like I have to ship something to LA. So it's like never like a dull moment. It's always like, where's Karen? 
well, she's doing this last minute right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, no, it's still, you know, college is really reality, to be honest. <laughs> it doesn't change. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I could see that. Do you want to tell the students a little bit about your new venture that you've been working on the last? So I think as we last spoke, I was creating it, right? Yeah. Um, COVID happened. So then there was a little pause to it. And um, what I'm doing is is bridal wear couture swimsuit for like their honeymoon and they're like their luxury, like um, honeymoon destination or honeymoon or like destination weddings that they do and they do greeting the bride greets the guest the night before rehearsal dinner so my market is high like my gowns start at 4500 but i would have brides that would want to come in and not spend that much so i said i have to come up with a brand where it could still be luxury and i'm able to market it to the lower clientele also so yeah. that um the brand Rivere, which means to dream in French. And we call the um so for the brides to dream the perfect beginning and whether it's from after they get married or before they get married, from cocktail dresses, we also dinner, shower dresses, um, suits, um little like lingerie for the honeymoon, luxury bridal swim up online now on my website which I never had that which is great to have I think especially now mm -hmm. um, yeah really like going like not just like clients in the US and what I would do private clientele I want like it's everywhere now like I have some like in Australia and like, Paris and Italy like you really yeah. want like, I like you know having these gorgeous swim and a lot of weddings are not big these days they're small so they'll have 50 people destination wedding and they want the dress before the dress to wear it for their like rehearsal dinner and like things like that and it's been doing great and i think it's been two months now since it's out wow yeah so it's it's been good <laughs> like my so i i mentioned <laughs> I mentioned before before your bio about how you mostly you cut to order. Um, uh, I, do you want to tell the tell, tell the students a little bit about your process with your bridal couture dresses, and then okay, and then so, I was wondering how you're doing, Rivera. Okay, so with the couture, they come in, and I do have a collection in my showroom every season that they actually get to try on, like different fits, different body. Um, so they actually get to feel the gown and quality on them. Um, and then from there, if they like a top, but they like a bottom, want a different type of um, lace or a different beading, everything is customized to the bride's what she likes. But of course, I have to agree with it because it's my design. So, because <laughs> sometimes if it's not my design, I won't do it if I don't like it. Yeah. Which is really hard with the custom market because you know if you just want to make a sale you are going to go away from your brand and i think it's very important to stay true to who your brand is and what you do um because we do turn a lot of clients from like no we don't do that you have them go to like a seamstress in the house and they'll do what you want you know right right it's very important to stay to who you are so they'll come in they'll try on the gown and i'll show fabrics that we have in stock or if they if they have time that I custom order fabric from from Europe um, but what's great is I get to reuse some of leftover fabrics from a previous bride that if somebody else wants and it doesn't go to waste or like I'll order what I need and I yeah. don't have the dresses in stock like I have per collection and then I'll sell the sample yeah so it's that's nice. very cool with the Rivera, I try to keep it the same luxury like market. So, yes, we, I want to sell it, but like I want to keep the quality the same. So, I have three seamstresses that we kind of train how we want the swim to be. Like, oh, wow. for a finish, if it's like end beading or like every swim has lining in it, there's no like overlock. Um, mm. Really, um, like a couture swim and 
So we kind of, because you can't, I tried factories for it and I wasn't happy with the quality. And I said, I don't want to lower my market like that. And if I do, then it would be either my Italy factory that I work with in Italy or my in-house work uh, seamstresses. And then there was three of them. We sat down and kind of did all the finishing um, detail and the stitching that will go into the swim and the cups and the beading and the fabric that's swim and still you're able to swim in it. That's the great part about it. Yeah, that's awesome. And then the sizes, we have like small, medium, or large. And then we do custom to our brides who are getting wedding gowns and they want to custom to them, then we'll do a custom swim to them. And oh. then another thing that is we don't sell something more than like I made 25 per swim and that's it. And if it's wow. sold, your next next collection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and where are your prices starting in Rivera? Actually, they're not as bad as they sound. Like um, they start at 450 for a swim, and then you can go up to 2,000. But that includes the cover up or like the cover up skirt. Um, so it's from like 450 to 2000 in Rivera. Yeah. Cocktail dresses are from 1500 to 3500 So it does definitely doesn't hit my couture market. So it's I try to keep it lower than my couture market. Yeah, that's great. So you, yeah. you, you capture the same clientele, but you kind of fill this niche for them, which is, which is a great way to expand your business. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So to piggyback on something you mentioned, you said you mentioned you may be opening a shop in Miami. How how have you zeroed in on that uh, location? I I did my lounge like my first um, thing that go shop Rivera was in Miami. Um, oh cool! I rented like a bungalow in like a hotel for the weekend. Mm, and cool. Like shop and like try on the swim because what better way than in Miami where it's nice and hot totally. <laughs> I have a photo shoot in New York in November and these poor models are freezing um, <laughs> but, um yeah so I said let's do it in Miami and then I have family in Miami my brother moved to Miami and a lot of my clientele moved to Miami due of COVID so I said, if I open something in Miami just for Rivera, I think, especially it's swim all year round. And to be honest, you don't have to be a bride to wear the swim. It's Yes, it's a right. white suit, but I have clients like buying it for their birthday or like they have it just for like a fancy, like, like event that they're going to. Like I have somebody that bought it for, they're having their 40th birthday in Bahamas and they're having Coachella style. And like she oh. bought a swim. Now it's like, Fun. which is, yeah, don't get bright to wear it. Like I own totally. a lot of. White, I love wearing white, you know. Yeah. So it hit another market that's not only bridal. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, New Year's in South America, I feel like is like all white and white bathing yeah. suits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool. Um. So, how can you tell us a little bit about how your companies? currently structured, how you're set up and how you've grown? So I have about, I like to keep my company small, <laughs> which I'm crazy, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have any partners, but my mom, um, she's my only partner in business. Um, I don't have investors. Um, I think if anybody's looking to be with investors or anything like that, I would recommend family first. Um, or go through a lot of lawyers before you do that. Um, I I have about 68 seamstresses that always on hand with my brides, depending on my seasons and what we do. I have somebody wow. who just corsets. I have someone who does everything. I do all fittings. I make sure I'm here for every fitting um, with my brides. Um, I'm very private with my clients, and that's what they love. They love the luxury of the privacy and being taken care of, not like when you walk to a bridal salon, hi, you have one hour, like choose five gowns, yeah. and then you have to leave, you know? That's not yeah. what you and I think they, they like the privacy and the quality that they get. Um, once 
we have the dress going. We have about three fittings. Usually the third fitting is a pickup. And that's where I make sure everything is perfect. And I always say, like, come with a sister or a mother or somebody that I'll show you how to get into the dress, how to zip the dress, so there's no confusion. Um, it's a little tough with my European clients right now because they, with the travel, so we have a lot of Zooms, a lot of, um, you know, I send swatches out a lot, a lot of UPS and like FedEx pickups and like sending boxes of swatches to them so they could actually feel the fabric. Cause like usually they will come in to see that or like for a fitting, they would see their fabric. Um, yeah. That changed because of COVID, which, uh, you no, know, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> <But it's> hard. <laughs> Um, so you have, you have a great, uh, following on social media and I, I have had a really amazing marketing presence. Any pro tips on how you got there or anything you did um, advise to getting the brand out there? In the beginning, I did it all. Like I did my social media and I do my, you know, my face, I don't really go on Facebook, but they say, Karen, you have to have a Facebook. I'm like, all right, just have it out there. But I don't really do Facebook. Um, I don't have Twitter. Like, again, like I'm very old school. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, and you know, I have all the interns that come in and they're like, you have to have Twitter. You have to have, I'm like, no, Instagram's enough. Like I can't like catch up all your like social media. It's enough. So I have a girl that does my Instagrams. Um, I do have a private page because she's like, stop posting your life on your business page. Like, don't post your kids on there. Go create your own. So I'm like, okay. So I created my own private Instagram. And then she does all my social media. Um, wow. You know, if any clients that come in, then with behind the scenes, she takes pictures. And we don't post a lot of our clients because we try to keep it private. We post about like 10% of our clients now. Um, but yeah, she does all that create, of course I approve it, but she does all the Instagram. That's great. That's very cool. And you've done some celebrity dressing as well. Yes. So that's another market <laughs> besides vinyl. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. and how'd you get into that? So graduating, I went into fashion week before I did bridal week. Yes, yes, I was doing bridal, but I wasn't so concentrated on bridal because, you know, everyone's dream is to dress the stars, you know, like whatever. I'll yeah. the bride, I'll be on the red carpet, you know. So we did a fashion week. And, and that's what I mean, like, try to stay to one category because I think from coming out of college, I was in two categories. Um, and I think that was a lot, you know. I yeah. Was Friday week and fashion week and as a beginner I think I think it was a lot for me and then I ended mm -hmm. up fashion week and I did just bridal week but the fashion week um people that I've met I'm still in contact with and of course Instagram opened to a lot more um stylists and celebrities that have used me and Know, we'll post this one and this one will post this one. It's like kind of like a chain. And I feel like I don't yeah. have a PR company. And I think my Instagram is my PR company. Um, yeah. <laughs> I stopped doing PR like eight years ago because I just felt like it was so much. Um, uh -huh. I created a relationship with stylists and, and that's how I do a lot of my work right now. Very cool. That's great. Um, how do you get inspired as a designer and stay inspired after um, time? I love magazines. Like that's something that I still buy. I know it sounds weird. Like, I don't know how <laughs> magazines, but like, <laughs> but I just love them. And I just think that it's very important. To, like I, I need to see things in front of my face, not just like scrolling up and like, and like, you know, like on the web. Um, I get inspired from like photo shoots. I get inspired from locations, from architects. Um, I can, I have a lot of books, a lot of books. And I think that's really what inspires me a lot. And like, especially beading and like fabric and the most 
like the more intricate detail it is, I could make a whole collection from like one swatch. Like if I love yeah. one fabric, I could create a whole collection from it. And I think I it's really I've been inspired by beauty as you say. It's like one yeah. of my, all around you, whether it's from dance or anything. Anything that's beauty in life, I think inspires me in my collection. Yeah. Well, so bridal wear is a little bit different in that it's sort of it. You don't have like set monthly deliveries the way like ready to wear would or something like that. How how often do you kind of sit down to design a collection? Well, there is you, there is yes. bridal, this fashion like bridal week, which I do. Um, mm -hmm. But I stopped doing it to the industry because, again, I work with private clientele. So I will have my yeah. collection right week, but it's to my clients. So I would have fashion shows, but it's privately fashion shows. And I would invite the press, but I don't need to invite the stores because it's I did the stores and I wasn't a fan of the stores. But I would, what I want to do now is from the fair, collection is go into bridal stores and have like a couture swim collection for the brides which I think is mm -hmm. nice new in the industry yeah. and don't have that so like yeah, yeah. you can wedding gown but like you would have a little section for like your honeymoon or like little lingerie or like little um, swimsuit when you go on vacation um, I think that could be really great in the industry to bring in which is trademarked by the way <laughs> 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 That's great. <laughs> Was that a difficult process? Um, no, no. You need a, it's like about a month process. They just need to see that like um, what you're doing is unique. It's not in the industry. They need to see like the logo and like label on the actual item, which uh -huh. is why they need to see that it's being in use. Otherwise, you can't trademark it if it's not being in use. So okay. it's like weird, like you have to brand it and then you have to trademark it instead of like trademarking it and then branding it. So that has yeah. to be boxes, like my tags, my logo, like we had to do all that before it was trademarked. Yeah. Oh, wow. Interesting. <laughs> um, so can you talk to us a little bit about how this past year has gone for you with COVID and, you uh, know, any adjustments you had to make? So... I think the bridal industry was hit hard, I think, with COVID because me personally, no, because every bride still got married, whether it's in her backyard or in her house or whether she had 20 people. Yeah, she didn't have the big ball gown, but I was making her cocktail dresses like, and she's like, save the ball gown when I get, have a big wedding next year, but I'm going to have a little ceremony. Some people did push their wedding for year or even 2022 so yeah overlapping which is you know is scary because there's a lot going on right now but yeah I think the venues and like florists like they did that I think that's who got hurt hard or like photographers um yeah now you always need a dress whether you get married with five people ten people or a hundred people so with me right. I was closed for three months from March to June because that was, I couldn't be open. But I felt like people in the, like, I got brides that couldn't go into salons and get their stuff in time because it was out of state. They were ordering a dress, mm -hmm. which with me, they were like, I can't get my dress in. I needed a dress, like, by three weeks. I'm like, all right, fine, extra work, like, extra workers. We got it done. Yeah. So, like, that's, I think that's the positive of doing everything in house, able to control it, and not depending on factories and things like that, which I think is yeah. positive in in my career and like in in this time also. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, well, I I think that you were willing to take us through your showroom a little bit. Are you are you up for that? <laughs> yeah, I'll just take you through my showroom. Um, it's so beautiful behind you. I love your fresh flowers. <laughs> I had a client. So I had a client come from LA, from actually San Francisco last week. Um, oh, so nice. So exciting. That was my first time meeting her, and she was like so excited. She sent me flowers. She was so sweet. Oh, that's um, great. I'm going to turn my camera so this way, if I know how to okay. do that. Perfect. 
Um, I'm just going to go like this. Okay. <laughs> so let's see. Okay, so this is, if you could see, this is my swim. <laughs> wow. <laughs> This is the swim that we did. So everything is like luxury, like beading. Everything is hand beaded. Students, if you have questions about anything, feel free to ask now too while she's showing the product. <laughs> about uh, the product, not you know, not your, not any other questions. And then, like as you can see, we do a lot of crochet for a swim. Ooh, and that's it's beautiful. Like beaded as well. And then you have cute like body suits made of lace. Gorgeous. And then so like, how, how much would something like that retail for? So this one's 620. 620. Which is not bad because if you go to like any bathing suit today, it's like yeah. you know, you're in the three fours. So this is one of our best seller right now. That's beautiful. I love that. It looks with the pearls. So it has pockets. So and fun. We had some bloggers wear it like out to dinner. <laughs> That's great. Um, and then you have our Revere cocktail dresses. So pretty. Love that. Is that does that have a little bit of like feather on it? Yes. We do a lot of feathers. So pretty. Do you, you um are are feathers popular for you year round or does it seem to be higher yeah. in the way? No, it's all year round. Depends what type of feathers, but ostrich feathers are usually all year round. Yeah. You might not put a lot, but you definitely put like, you know, in the a little sprinkling. Yeah. Like this is a great shower dress that we do a lot. Oh, that's stunning. It's like it has the gipur and then it has the feathers at the bottom with the pearls. Um, and then you go into our couture. So as you can see, a lot of ruffles and big. And I don't know if students who know fashion and sewing, if you could see the detail of the stitching. It's a lot yeah. of stitching. Wow. So like wow. there's about 700 yards in the skirt. Oh my gosh, that is so much. <laughs> Although I guess it's organza or what? Is it, what what material is it? Is it organza or? Yeah, this is silk organza, yeah. So, mm -hmm. Even though that's a lot of material, at least it's light material. <laughs> yeah, it's light, yeah. You know what it is? We do have a lot of materials with like beading, like let's say like this one. Mm, um, yeah. We tend to get heavy, but our corsetry, we're known for like a fit and like a corset fit. And like your waist can go to your hips, so like you don't really feel the weight. You know, yeah. and then we have beautiful like laser cut laces from Paris that we use a lot. Beautiful. Um, again, like it's all about the corsets and the fit that we do. Yeah. Um, then we have our fully beaded, like fully, fully crystallized. Like this was one in the Grammys. Oh my gosh. By, um, a rapper. But it was like all strassy crystals and pearls. How much it, weighs, it weighs a lot. It's like really, really, really heavy. Oh but the construction inside is like what makes it hold. And then we did a short version because a lot of people loved it. Beautiful. Um, again, then I'm going to show you. So this is where you come into the store. Oh, nice. This is my window, my new collection. We had um, the collection was called like in my sketchbook, and basically we had like models come out of the sketchbook. Cool. Uh, like from art coming to life, and then we went into my bridal wear, more modern bridal. Oh, that's pretty. Love that. Um, and it's a lot of lace and bonings and detail. Are you doing much like initial showings to people this way, like with the over virtual or are people coming in still? Oh, I, my European clients and like my, my out of state, a lot of Zoom. Yeah. I never did so much computer in my life and I hate computer. <laughs> 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 I know, oh yeah, my gosh, I love that. That's beautiful. 
Yeah, and then you have our silk at draping, a lot of drapes. Gorgeous. Like drapery. And then you go into our evening wear, which is like, again, like pinks and like a lot of fluff. Yeah. Um, and then you go into the golds. Oh, so pretty. Um, do most of your brides wear white or do some of them actually choose color? No, we have blush. We do this type of blush. Yeah. A lot of brides like this blush. Mm, blush yeah. and white. Or they would have like a lot with the nude on there, like this one. Yeah. Anna, did you have a question? Yeah, um, are you finding that your uh, your brides and clients are kind of shifting to a more creative direction? Are you noticing that there's a lot more um, difference in your like silhouettes lately, or? Um, it depends. No, like I have, like a lot of my brides that come here won't just wear a gown. Like, then they could go to any store and buy it off the rack. Um, when they come here, they know they want to look special and unique. So they still have weddings, like big weddings. Whether it's 150 people, they still want to look grand and beautiful. So whether it's a big gown or not, they still want the luxury in the detailing, and they still want to look unique. Um, it's the beach and destination weddings that we see that they want more of like a slim and like a line not as big in the fit um i'm mostly known in the industry for ball gowns uh, my brides are more ball gowns and i think from covid like the weddings are not as big so they're going more towards like an a line but they still want it like detailed and drama but just not as big yeah what would you say is like your style philosophy um so i like my brides to look timeless um i think that's my biggest philosophy that i tell every bride like you want to look at your pictures like 10 20 years from now and you still want to look at your pictures and be like oh my god i love my dress yeah um, looking timeless elegant chic not I, I don't like when brides look too fashionable because a bride shouldn't look fashionable like your evening wear should look fashionable or like your shower dress or but not your wedding gown. I think it just looked timeless. Yeah. No, I got married 10 years ago and I had my 10 year anniversary photo shoot and I wore, I had a wedding coat and I wore my wedding coat for the photo shoot and like, I still love my gown. That's awesome. I think being timeless and looking at your dress so many years from now and still loving it, I think it's very important. It's not like, oh, what was I thinking with these puffed sleeves in the 80s? And now it's not anymore, you know? Totally, <laughs> yeah. It came back. I do a lot of puff sleeves. <laughs> That's never, everything old is new again, right? <laughs> yeah. A lot of my friends love the puff sleeves. Yeah. yeah. Well, then Kate Middleton wearing, like, the long sleeve for her wedding, I feel like, brought back that kind of, like, 70s sleeve. So, yeah, the Kate dress, like, the Chantilly wet, like, I'm known for, like, a lace. Um, Chantilly wedding gowns. That's like mostly what my brand is known for, like that timeless Chantilly. And when I saw her dress, I'm like, oh my God, that looks like one of my dresses with the long sleeve. And everybody, you know, they would think they would wear sleeve for like religion purposes or like, but it's not because I think it's so beautiful and elegant on a bride, especially you see the lace on your hand. Yeah. Timeless. So I'm really known for like Chantilly bowl gowns. That's what my brand is known for. And I think just keeping it timeless and classy, I think that's what a bride should be like. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Azat, did you have a question? Yes, thank you so much. So, uh, yes, I, I saw that's all gorgeous dresses. That was like really amazing. So I, I have a question about like, uh, are there like, uh, I'm also uh, going that uh, like special occasion. Mm -hmm. So I love that swear. Uh, so I have a question about customers. Are there some customers that uh, came like uh, ask for like a uh, colorful like some wedding dress like a bold color like even hand painting on it or something like that?
I, I can hear. I'm sorry, I think you cut out a little bit, Karen. We, uh, we can't hear you. I don't, can you hear us? Hmm. Let's see. Oh, she's reconnecting. You're reconnecting. There you are. Give her a back. There you are. I think you're back again. Am I back? Yes. Okay, but I can't hear you. Oh, what happened? You can't hear me now? No. No. Um, we can hear you if you want to talk. <laughs> Maybe. Can you hear me now? Okay, students, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I can hear you. I think it's Karen's connection. Well, I'm going to turn my camera off because I know sometimes that helps like make the connection a little better across the board. I don't know. Can you hear us now, Karen? Hmm. I think she's joining from another account, so hopefully it'll just be a second. Can you hear us now? Now I can hear you. Okay, great. We hear you too. Perfect. Oh, sorry, I logged down and I logged back in because something happened. I don't know what happened. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So, so sorry. What was the question? I heard something about customers. Yes. I, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, are there uh, some cards? I know uh, all the girls like, like dreaming about white wedding dress. Are there some customers that are uh, asking for you, like uh, some bold colors or some hand painting, like something like that, or not a, like a white, white dress? Some other no. much customers like that. So I do have clients that are, you know, from the middle, um, and I do a lot of gold. Hello? Hi. Yeah, okay. So we do a lot of gold and blushes. Um, we do some mint green wedding gowns, um, but mostly white, but a lot of ivory. We don't do white, white. That's not a lot of our clients. Uh, we do more like a cream peach. That's a lot of the clients that like the peach and the creams. Mm, that sounds pretty. Thanks so much. Yeah. <laughs> Ariana, did you have a question? I like gold. Yeah. So that's colors that bright. You're cutting in and out a little bit. Can you can you hear us okay? Karen, can you hear us okay? Thinking her connection is spotty because I see there's a red bar for her name. Yeah. She's frozen. <laughs> I'm sure she'll be right back. Should we put it in the chat that maybe she needs to rejoin or? Yeah, I bet you. Yeah. I'll chat her on the side. I... Oh, can you hear us? No. You're a little frozen for, uh, or it's cutting in and out. Very slow. <laughs> so 
are you? Hear how? You are, if you can hear me, um, you're freezing a little as you're talking. Try turning up your camera, maybe, and then we can at least hear you. You guys, we did a pretty good job. I think, what are we on, week eight? And this is the first time we've had some major technical issues. Yeah, yeah I would say so. I hear a lot more in fall. <laughs> Pro tip also, I don't know if anyone else has told you guys this, but I've discovered that if I shut down my computer right before class, I always have a lot better connection for whatever reason. Feel free to try that out on your own. Okay, so maybe she. I think we officially lost her, so hopefully she'll be back in a second. Um, let me let me take this time so that we're not wasting it to discuss with you guys. Um, oops, oops, where's my PowerPoint? Why is it not showing up? There we go. So discuss with you guys um, the midterm survey that you all filled out. I just wanted to say thank you for your feedback and um, touch on a couple of different things. So I, first of all, I really, really appreciate all of you who did fill out the survey just because it, it's a great touch point halfway through the semester to see where we're connecting, where we're hitting up with each other and where there's confusion or call outs. And it's always really helpful to kind of forge ahead for the rest of the semester. So thank you, thank you. Um, there was a couple of points about schedule and lineup and diversity of speakers. And uh, I just wanted to touch on this. One of my main goals with getting people in to come speak with you guys is to have a diverse lineup of speakers from around the industry because you all, most of you, want to be designers or owners of your own company. And if I was to just line up a schedule of designers only the entire semester long, I can tell you it would be super boring by the end of the semester. You know, there would be a lot of repetition, there'd be a lot of talking about how certain people got in certain places, but this way, the way that the course has been designed and always been designed is that you guys can learn a little bit about people who you're going to deal with when you're out in the industry so that you are better uh, prepared to get out there and um, be a successful designer. Karen, is that you? Are you back? Maybe. No, not quite. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that that is by design, that we do not have all designers the entire semester long. And I want to be upfront about that and clear about that. Uh, that said, there are a lot of amazing designers on the lineup for the second half of the semester. So hopefully you can get your questions out there. And if you ever feel like you need more resources, I'm here and can connect you with some other people. I also post all classes on my YouTube from even when we were live in person. So if you have someone, if you wanna look through who I've had in the past, you can also see that there are other um, designers that you could hone in on. I think there was also a call for maybe more men to be speaking. I think there will be a few um, at the end of the semester. I actually tried to go out of my way to have a bit more of a diverse lineup this semester. Um, so maybe it didn't fall to, uh, to white men as much as it may have in the past, but that's to say there are still a lot of them on my YouTube account as well. Um, for deliverables, uh, there were a couple of call outs about when, uh, when things are due and, you know, what, what goes into them. I just want to put the stress back on you guys that my main goal in this class is preparing you for the industry. And I set up, I told you guys at the beginning of the semester what was going to be due when, and I posted it in the syllabus. And then I've always been here for questions that you may have to ask. If there is ever, at any point in time, any questions about any deliverable that you have, any assignments that you have, 
please ask because I only know where there's confusion if there's a question. Otherwise, I assume you understood what I told you and we're all on the same page. Uh, no, no question is a stupid question. Even, re you know, re repeated questions is completely fine. If I was your boss, I would want you to ask me as many questions as possible before you went out and spun your wheels and did work on things that were not right. So the same goes for assignments. And um, just want to encourage you guys to speak up about that. Uh, another call out is on recordings. I just want to make sure it's very, very clear that every class is recorded. And so if you ever want to go back and look at them, they are live on my YouTube as well as these PowerPoints getting posted uh, to the Blackboard site so that if you want to go back and look at them, you can. And then a couple of people have called out chat, coming together and chatting at the end of the class, which I thought was a great call out. And so instead of doing an attendance survey today, we're going to test it out and do our attendance questions live after we're done speaking with Karen, assuming we get Karen back. Hopefully she'll be back in a second. Does anyone have questions on this or call outs? I know it was an anonymous survey, so no pressure to speak, but. Um, I had a question um, in regards to the extra credit. Sometimes I check the Instagram. Are, is it in stories? Is it in the posts? Is it? Uh, I've done two so far this semester. One was in the post and one was in the story. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, I have been doling out extra credit every single week for the best attendance answers that come my way. It's not all, it's not only one person a week. It could be more than that. So. Um, I appreciate the thoughtful replies and always try to reward them. So let's see, is Karen back? Here we go, number four, she's reconnecting again. Any other questions, you guys? Thanks for that question, Bob, though, it's a good one. Karen, are you back? Can you hear us? Ah, reconnecting. Okay. <laughs> oh, yay! There you are. That's great. <laughs> okay. Well, Ariana has had her hand patiently raised, so I'll let her jump in with her question. Hi. Um, I'm also interested in going into evening wear, so I wanted to ask if you ever feel like there are limitations as a designer when you're specifically in bridal wear, or is it like an arena where you feel you can be even more creative? Um, I think in evening wear and bridal wear is where you can most be creative. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I like going into this field because the bigger, the more detail, um, you know, it's just there. And, you know, the evening where there's no end to creativity. It's really your mm -hmm. imagination that you get to put in and then to reality, um, which is what I love. Um, I just think there's no end to creativity when it comes to evening wear and bridal. Um, even though in my bridal collection, I try to keep it, like I said, like timeless, but I still have creativity um, in each bride today has her own unique specialized dress I 80% of the time I repeat a design that I did in my gowns awesome yeah did that cut out a little bit for you it did at the end but I, I understood Perfect. like that you feel that you know, there's no end to creativity in bridal wear. And I was looking at your Instagram. I definitely can. I saw things that I never imagined would be wedding gowns, and I definitely agree with that. So, yeah. Okay. 
Oh, I think we're frozen again. Karen, can you hear us? Maybe. <laughs> if she can hear me, thank you for answering my question. <laughs> Thanks for the question. I think I've got a red X for her name now, so hopefully she's reconnecting. Oh. Isn't it so weird? I, I'm sure you guys are experiencing this on your side. How some days you just have bad connections and some days you have fine connections and there's and there seems to be no rhyme or reason. <laughs> Yeah, it's very frustrating. Super frustrating. I live in the so it's like super spotty. Where do you live? Um, I live in like rural Jersey. Oh, yeah. Is that anything? Karen, we hear you now. Can you hear us? Heard you for a second at least. <laughs> Can you hear us? <laughs> Thumbs up. No. It, it's very slow. Um, Karen, can you hear us? Yeah. There's a suggestion yeah. from a student that maybe in a brood and, and bridal, I think it's a beautiful industry. Here we got it. I'm going to, uh, maybe she can see that. Um, Pam, thanks for the tip. I don't know if she has the number to dial in, though. Let me see. Oh, number five. Karen, number five is coming back. shoot her an email I think I'm back hi <laughs> I just took a different computer let's see if this one's better <laughs> yeah. um and I have like double internet here so weird <laughs> well we were just I don't I'm sure you couldn't hear us but we were just saying there never seems to be any rhyme or reason to it like some days you just have bad internet and there's no reason why so yeah I I'm I'm going to shoot you an email right now because there's a dial-in option that might work better if you get kicked out again. Okay. Um, that might just be easier. Okay. I'm just sending that your way. Um, let's see. There I am. Okay, so I will pass it along to someone else's question. Allison, you have your hand up next. Yes, hi, sorry, I'm also struggling. Um, can, can you hear me? I hear yeah. you guys. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry. Um, I don't know if anyone asked this yet because my internet's also like cutting in and out. Um, but um, as an independent designer, what does your typical day look like? for you like do you find yourself consumed by your work a lot because that's how i imagine i imagine it's like you're like you're rushing from deadline to deadline um so being i like i said like i do have three kids at home mm. so you waking up in the morning at six so yes i have my you know my nanny that comes in and helps out but i'm with them about 6 30 and after school around eight o'clock and then the day starts and I first have my first coffee at 8 a.m. <laughs> and then it's emails back and forth with my assistant um, of the day what's going to happen appointments fittings um, new clients um, I'm fully booked till about eight o'clock at night depending on what day of the week um, but I did create myself a very strong schedule mm -hmm. that Friday, four o'clock, I'm clocked out of work until Sunday. 
Um, mm -hmm. I don't want any phone calls, any emails, no fittings, unless it's like an emergency because I like to have like family time on the weekends. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's very important to give yourself a schedule where it's, unless it's an emergency, then you can, um, you know, come into work. Of course, I make exceptions for clients who are out of state and flying for the weekend, but I try not to. I try to be here late night, which I'm okay with as long as I have my weekends off. Mm -hmm. um, a day in my life is is crazy <laughs> um, but we yes. make it happen today it's from appointment to appointment is from dress to dress because again like all of a sudden you have a stylist calling you and we need a dress in like four days you have to get that done in four days you can't say no mm -hmm. um so late nights um over time like if i'm up all night of the hours then i'm up if i get three hours sleep three hours sleeps I think is being responsible and being um, con like just staying in a straight line and just trying to concentrate what's next on your agenda. I think will help you, um, you know, will help you in the future. Do you, like help prevents you from getting burnt out. Um, again, I think my weekends are very important that I have off. So that's where I get to recuperate and like where mm -hmm. I get to like sit home and like enjoy my family. Um, you know, I won't come in to work. I don't want to hear any emails. I don't want to hear any clients on the weekends unless it's an emergency. Mm -hmm. And that okay. really means one one. <laughs> okay. Not like hi, someone's here to pick up a dress, uh, you know, like little things like that. And yeah, totally cut off. I think it's very important to have a good team that understands you and they are there for you for these um, times also. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Monica, I have you next. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So I wanted to ask now that people are having smaller weddings and like the industry has been so affected by COVID have that has that changed how you approach your the design of, of your collections um no because again like I'll have my couture wear and then I have my you know my clients who want smaller if having smaller weddings I design to the client is custom made um but I always have my couture wear because I just feel like you know, again, like if a stylist come or I have a celebrity bride, like they want to see creativity. They don't want to see simple dresses. They can go anywhere and get simple dresses. So I'm pretty true to my designs and to my brand. And I, I think it's the most important. I keep repeating myself, I know, but I think it's very important to stay to who you are and not kind of like fold the lines to where the industry or people want you to be. And that's what I'm known for. I'm known for high-end, one-of-a-kind, unique gowns in the industry. That's great. I think that's, yeah, what, certainly why you've, you've had, you've grown such a large following. So, well, not yeah. specifically, but, you know, it's, it's like gone through the roof with the followers. So, obviously, yeah. people know you for that. <laughs> Anything yeah, else? Any oh. I don't know. Any other she may have frozen too, Monica. I don't know. I, I hear you perfectly. Thank okay. you. <laughs> uh, Haley, I see you next. Hi. So um, you started a boutique for made-to-order gowns, and that is something that I'm really interested in doing. So what is your advice for someone who hopes to do something like that but is new to it and just starting out? Okay. So I think um, you need to look for a location. First of all, you got to source your location um, where you want to have the boutique and make sure that there's not a lot of made to order gowns where you are looking to open. Um, I would say Instagram is a great start. Um, and even if you take a few free clients, I know I hate saying it, but like, hey, I'll make you this dress. Can you post? I'll make you this dress. Like Instagram is such an open platform these days that 
you know, you could really go from zero to nothing to like really, really high also. And I think if you reach out to the right people and saying, I'm going to, I'm willing to make your free wedding gown, um, which can you post me and, and first build a clientele before you open a location um, because it's a lot of expense. So I definitely think you should build a clientele, at least like somewhat of a clientele, whether you work in your basement or you work in your mom's house, set a nice studio, post about it, make it look pretty creative, um, and then go from there and not just go to run to open a location. Thank you. That's my welcome uh jack you're up next hi so is there any times that you ever feel like completely overwhelmed by a project that you're working on or like super stressed out by like a deadline and if so do you like how do you uh, prefer to deal with it yourself um so I think May, June, July, I call it hell, <laughs> May, June, hell, <laughs> because every bride gets married in July, and then you have my husband's birthday in June that never gets seen, so I told him he married the wrong girl, because I never see him on his birthday, <laughs> um, and then all my kids' birthday, of course, fall around that time. <laughs> Um, so it's really stressed when you have a family and every bride gets married around that time. And again, like I work with every client, um, personally in every phase to make sure every pin, every waistline um, gets put on, right? Even though I have my team, I like to be there because I'm a control freak. And I think that's just, just me in the industry. And that's what makes it. My brand, I think, so unique um, that the designer is actually there for every fitting and not trust everyone else in the team. Um, I tend to vacations. Short one. It comes. They're really. It's cutting out again on my side. Is it for you, Jack? Or yeah, it is. But I'm getting like the important, like little important snippets that, you know. <laughs> that little tip. Yeah. Um, hopefully she'll unfreeze. Um. Up and I. She's totally gone now. Whole week. Oh. Well, and then your person is like delayed. She so probably vacation said in August. So those are my two looking forward things that I do every year and. So it's so, and if it's just that she has no connection, I don't know if she's trying to get back in on another account. Um, I see one other hand up. Does anyone else have questions that they intend to ask? If so, put your hand up just so we can kind of cruise through while we have her <laughs> connected and then we'll be good. Karen, are you back? I 
don't know if I see your name, but you know here. Well, let's just give her one more minute and then I'm going to say, oh, I see another account. She's trying to join from it. Um, I would say, too, if you guys are have a question and you're feeling frustrated by this experience, we can try to put you in direct contact over email so that you can make sure you really get your question answered. Um, I see you're on, but I don't see the camera. Well, that's okay. There, I hear you. I'm back. Sorry. I don't Hi. know what's going on with the internet. I'm in my back okay. now, so let's hope this works better. Okay, cool. Well, if we lose you again, if we lose you again, would it be okay if I just, the questions that are remaining, if I have them reach out to you over email, would that be okay? Oh, please do. I'm sorry, like, about okay. this connection, but um, they can email me. Um, anytime and I'll make sure I'll answer all questions um, by tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you. I know. Um, don't, don't feel bad. This, this happens. It's not anyone's, <laughs> anyone's fault when they have a bad connection. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you want to ask anything else or did you feel like you got your question answered? Did we lose Jack? <laughs> now we lost Jack. <laughs> now Karen's back. Yeah. Wait, wait. Oh. There we go. No, okay. I don't have any more questions. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, you did. All right, so I'm going to take a good vacation, if that makes sense. <laughs> All right, good, because I am taking one after the semester's over. Exactly. So you know that is. <laughs> important. Yeah, it's important. Um, William. Um, yes, thanks for joining us. Um, so I know you mentioned that uh, you like working with the client one on one and getting to know them. But besides that, what's uh, your favorite part of the design process? Um, so my favorite part of the design process is not repeating my gowns over and over. Um, when I used to sell to client phones, I think what I hated most is making the gown again and again. And again, and I was like, and I know people would be happy to get all the orders. And I'm like, get the same dress. I don't want to drip. And even though I had the pattern for it, it just felt like a cookie cutter. And redoing. Thing over. So I think we may have lost her again, but it's, it seems like what she's saying is her favorite uh, thing about her specific bridal wear couture uh, niche is that she gets to do something different every time and keep, keep creating and keep exploring, which is definitely unique, particularly with a lot of the speakers that we've had in this semester. Um, you know, their goal is to make as many of one style as possible. And Karen is really enjoying making one to three of the same style. So we'll see if we get her back. Were there any other questions, you guys? Do you want to just raise your hand if you had a question to ask, even though we don't have Karen? I'm sorry for the bad uh, for the bad connection, but say la vie, say uh say COVID, right? <laughs> Wow. It looks like she's reconnecting, but um, B a unique custom design, I think. favorite part because your creation always and not doing the same thing over and over. Did we lose again? 
I, I think we have, um, well, you were, you were in and out and then it was like a, something that you said a while ago, you know, it was like paused and an unpaused. So, um, I don't know if you can hear us, Karen, but thank you for being here. We really, really appreciated the insight and getting to see your showroom. And we wish you the best of luck as you enter your crazy season. So soon she may be back. We'll see. We'll see if she comes back to us. But in the in the meantime, I wanted to open it up to you guys. So as I said, I would like to try to do this class a little bit differently. We won't do this every week, but um, you know, this week it, it will work. Uh, let's answer this question live. So as our final attendance question, discussing in person, uh, what is the most interesting thing you learned today? And what do you want to learn more about and couture design, if anything? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw this question in the chat so that you guys can remember it. We don't have to stay on that screen. Any volunteers to go first? Um, so, Philip, are you, or Caleb, you're speaking. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't tell who started chatting. <laughs> Who started speaking? I'll go. Uh, I guess I feel like I learned, or I'm really interested in learning more about the like custom made to order um, like business model. I think that that's something that I definitely could see myself doing in the future. So I think it's kind of given me like a little spark to do a little bit more research and learn a little bit more about how different designers are kind of coping with the different challenges of doing like a made to order business. Yeah. Yeah, I know she was in and out a bit, but I feel like uh, it does keep it very joyful and keeps it feeling very artistic um, as opposed to commercial with maybe some other jobs that exist out there for design. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Amber, I see your hand up. Uh, hi, Professor. Yeah, so I really enjoyed listening to the speaker. I know she was going in and out, but um, I, did, I did, did think that from what she said, I learned quite a bit. The one thing that I want to do, um, not not want to do, what I want to learn more about couture design um, is a little more specific as I really like to sew. So I wanted to know, like, I want to learn more about ins and outs and all the secret sort of techniques that they use to really make a garment really good. Um, and again, coming off from, I think previously Caleb said the business model. Um, yeah, I really want to learn more about that too, because I feel like what's really not really paid attention to in the fashion industry is mostly how to run a business. It's mostly like, oh, if you can design well, then you'll have a successful business, but you really have to know how to like run a business. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Um, and I, I think that's something that we can touch on with some of the other speakers as well, that especially people who maybe have more of a business mindset. And I think a lot of really strong designers just know know that maybe that's not their biggest strong suit and kind of lean in to, to find people who kind of support that and back it up so that they're not all out on their own trying to run the business when it's not their um, strength, their own personal strength. At least I've heard that from a few people. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Philip. Um, yeah, I what I found interesting is just understanding that the type of business that she runs, she may she makes sure that she's off on the weekends. And from what you know we see and and hear is that fashion is a 24 hour seven business. So you don't, you're not really a lot of that time on the weekends because you might have to do something, run here, run there to get things finished by a deadline and things of that nature. But it's just interesting to see that even in this busy time, she still makes time to, you know, cater to her mental health, spend time with her family, things of that nature. Um, yeah. And when, what I would love to learn more about couture design is really, um, piggybacking off of what Amber and Caleb have said is just really learning more of the ins and outs and understanding um, uh, the real, the good techniques to become a successful uh, couture designer because it, at, looking at her designs, they're very intricate and 
and they take a lot of time and really kind of how to be successful as that. Yeah. And I, I feel like finding an internship where you can really study someone uh, along those lines would be something that'd be super helpful. Uh, obviously, it's harder these days getting in person to do that. But she, I mean, she mentioned that she has interns. I know that she usually has three or four a semester. So, you know, a person where you could just kind of shadow for a couple of days, a couple of weeks would be probably a, a good way to start too. But thank you. Uh, is that Yes, thank you. Uh, so one more important point I, I got uh, from this interview that uh, 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 there's some point uh, like uh, when you need someone to share your business to get more powerful and how she said it's better to share with family members. Otherwise, you will go to a lot of paperwork and like uh, to find some like if you want to share with others like uh, sponsors or some of this, you, you will need a lot of lawyers and like a lot of paperwork. And that's important. Yeah. Yeah. For the point. yeah. I, I feel like that is a, a point I've heard from a lot of speakers over the years is just be careful who you get into business with um, when you're starting out. Yeah. Right. I mean, even, even if you watch a few shark tanks, you can feel that way, right? <laughs> um, thanks. Haley. So I wanted to learn more about the made to order also, because like I said, that's something I really want to do in the future. And I thought it was very interesting and smart how she incorporated the swimwear part as well into her brand. I really love that. Yeah, I know it's so different. You really don't see that out there. Um, very interesting. Who's next? Anna. Yeah, I would definitely say the most interesting thing from today with her doing couture is just how many, like, different, it would be interesting to see all the different orders that she had that have a lot more color incorporated, because obviously I feel like America's industry of for wedding is always cream, ivory, you know, that kind of thing. But of course, everywhere around the world, there's just like, there's so many colors happening. So like, it'd be oh, interesting yeah. to see a little bit more of that in her showroom too, but. I think yeah. also one thing I'd like to learn about couture is again, made to order of just like what, how many hours are going into all of those dresses that have like those feathers in them and all of those beads and who's spending that time because those were, I mean, they were gorgeous, but it was just like, wow, they're just hanging around in her showroom right now. But yeah. So much detail. I know, yeah. totally. They're so stunning. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Michaela. Uh, hi, I'm sorry. Hi. Um, one thing I thought was interesting was when Monica had asked her whether the um the the, the current situation, the pandemic, kind of affects her designing, and she said no. Because I thought it would. I thought maybe you know if people were still having weddings during this time, they'd be a lot smaller, and would a lesser crowd mean you know you'd be willing to dial it down for your dress if less people are going to see it? So I was pretty surprised when she said no. I guess it just really depends on the person, like she said. Well, and it's also sort of interesting if you think about it. If the average bridal gown is fifteen hundred, which by the way is still quite a bit of money, and hers are starting at forty five hundred, you can imagine that her clientele is probably you know, yeah. quite high on the list. So even if they're going to have a dialed down wedding, they're probably going to still spend outrageous amounts of money on the whole wedding. So mm -hmm. um, it's probably, she was a little bit um, re recession proof or COVID proof because she had such a high end customer. Um, thank you. Uh, William. Um, yeah. So I, th I thought um, one thing that I would want to learn more about uh, is how you can really uh, tailor, tailor your design to the client specifically, especially when she mentioned like um, clients in Europe and in the Middle East, how you can, um, you, you know, take into consideration cultural differences uh, in the design and, and still keep it on brand. Um, and then yeah. something I would also want to learn more about is kind of piggybacking off of what Amber said. I would like to just uh, shadow the seamstresses and uh, learn a lot more about like how you manipulate maybe even the same textile differently depending on its end use in the garment or like, um, and especially I'm, I'm interested in a lot of uh, like hand sewing as well. 
Yeah, yeah. Day in the life of a seamstress be pretty interesting. Uh, thank you. Who's up next? Um, I mean, I would agree with Evan. Like, I feel like designing um, specifically to a person's interests and their culture is very interesting. So I feel like for designers, it gives them better like range and it helps them expand like their creative visions. So that's something I would be interested in. Great, thank you. Who's next? Maybe I'll go in order of my tenant sheet, which would be Ariana. Who actually is having connection problems? Um, Marsha. Um, I mean, I think kind of like what Anna said, I found it interesting that she said that her client base doesn't typically go for like white, white, which I'm surprised by because I thought that's what the, um, I thought that's what everyone wanted, but I guess it's yeah. a different time seeing that people want something that's a little bit more, um, uh, what's the word, like a little bit more, um, I guess just yeah. like a, a more, I don't know the word, the contemporary <laughs> is the word. <laughs> not yeah. classic whatever the opposite of not classic is yeah um but uh i think i would like to be able to learn more about because i find bridal to be something to me is something like really classic and the way that they're able to modernize a wedding dress without um i mean the, the way that they're able to modernize a wedding dress and still have it look like a wedding dress but be more um like more have more of a contemporary look. I think that's something that I would like to work on more because I have a, a, a habit of just taking older ideas and not really invent reinventing them as much. And the way that she's able to, you know, make something that's so modern, I just want to know like what is her thought process when she designed something as far as like yeah finding elements that that she can use from today and using something from you know like a more something that's like more traditional and turning it into something basically like bridal i think is really interesting that i want to learn more how to do yeah. hello which is kind of cool Oh, I, I couldn't hear no, anything. I feel like you guys but... are having trouble hearing me, but. Yeah. I said, I, she, you know, she says she goes out of her way to be timeless, which I do think she does a really great job with, but I also feel like it looks really fresh and new yeah. and like, not like what you said, which is really cool. So, thank you, Marsha. Uh, Matthias. Um, I found like um, the most interesting thing is uh, to view her store. Uh, it's very uh, nice and clean, and um, you see like uh, the dresses on the side, and how they uh, uh, kind of like uh, 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 render it. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, I mean, it kind of makes you crave going to a store. <laughs> right. Thank you. Uh, the next person I have on my list is Andrew. Andrew, you there? Okay. Uh, Jennifer? Hi, can you hear me? Professor? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Can hear me. Something Let's turn my camera off for a second because maybe my connection will. Uh, something that I found that was really but interesting I can hear you. was uh, how she was able to find ways to stay true to herself. Like she would tell customers or in a sense, turn customers away when they would go too far away from what her aesthetic or her design line and hopes for her design were. Yeah. I totally appreciate that about her. I feel like she's really true to herself, which is 
hard to do in this industry. It's hard to stay true to yourself the whole way through. So it's very cool. Um, Kathleen Deering, I have you next. Hi. Um, I didn't know that there was like a market for bridal swim or like swimwear for your wedding. <laughs> so like, I thought that was a really interesting. I don't know if I was crazy or not, but I think she mentioned that they're like white and I feel like that has to be a really niche market. I don't know. I would just never heard of it. <laughs> So I thought I just it was yeah. Well, I mean, I think destination weddings are just growing, right? I mean, or they were before the before the pandemic, and maybe they'll be back again. But um, I highly encourage you guys to check out both her Instagram accounts for both for both the the bridal line and the Revere um, line. They're really very stunning. I love that she showed us her uh, room. like her stuff was so beautiful, and the fact that she like walked around her like studio, like I love that she did that. Oh, good. I'm glad you guys got to see it. Um, Allison. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I feel like everyone pretty much covered what I want. Like, I really like sewing the way Amber said. So, like, I would like to know what like small techniques they use to make things like more individualistic like beading or embroidery or like maybe even painting it like I, I want to know like what makes it look professional rather than like homemade you know what I mean yeah yeah you know since this is coming up from a lot of you guys I'm, I'm gonna send her a follow-up email asking about that um, and see if she has anything she could pass along it's great. Thank you. Um, no problem. Abby Grace, I see you next. And actually, Ariana just made a comment, which was that there is an as a whole couture techniques class in the bachelor's program uh, for anyone who is not on their last semester and will want to check that out in the fall. Hi. Um, I thought it was interesting how she said the swimsuit was like six hundred something dollars, and I just, I want to learn more about like how to price your designs and like how she finds clientele that are willing to pay that much for a swimsuit. And then I also just thought the swimsuit idea was cool as well. And I was thinking you can even add to that and do like lingerie and like a rehearsal dinner dress and stuff like a whole kind of collection for the itinerary, the wedding itinerary. So I yeah. thought it was really cool. Totally. Typically with pricing, um, you have a certain amount of money that you want to make as a percentage. So if you know how much your item is going to make to cost, cost you to make rather, then you would use that to back into what you'd retail it for. Um, I have to imagine she's operating somewhat similarly, uh, even though she's very specialized and it's, you know, very few pieces that she makes. But um, a typical, a typical markup for something that's in-house like this would be like 80% markup. So your cost would be about 20% of that. And then you'd kind of roll up to where you want your retail to be. Okay. Um, so obviously you could see, you could see the detail when she's showing the bathing suit. And it obviously is a very expensive bathing suit comparative mm -hmm. to what you usually see on the beach. Thank you. Uh, Caleb, did you have something to add? No problem. Maybe he raised his hand by mistake. Jack. Uh, going off the bathing suit thing, I think it's like particularly genius from like, if you think about somebody coming in to pay a whole bunch of money for a custom wedding dress, and then she kind of just pulls out and you can also get a matching swimsuit too. That's like something I didn't know existed, but how hard could it be to sell when it's just like, when the clients are right there? It's a really good point. Um, these people are coming into her showroom and dropping, you know, thousands of dollars and she has nothing else to sell them as like an add on item. So now she has this whole other niche, um, which is, yeah, it's genius to kind of tack something on. So thank you. Um, Andrew. Hi. Yeah. I also wanted to just add on to what Jack said. Like I've never heard of it either. I don't really, know anything about bridal so far and I was just doing like research on her Instagram and how she's marketing her 
bridal slash um, swimwear couture type thing. And I just think it's really interesting, like just the way she targets her market. And then like what she was saying about, you know, how she was doing during COVID, just because it was interesting to hear from from her saying, you know, it wasn't really a huge effect on her brand, which is interesting just because I know a couple people that are similar to her, but, you know, a lot of people are the opposite. So it was interesting to hear. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it was interesting. I, by the way, I, I meant to touch on your midterms at the beginning of class too. Um, you guys did an amazing job and it was really awesome reading your point of view. Uh, and a few of you said that you really disagreed with the comments from the article on the last question, ha uh, saying that luxury was going to be quick to bounce back. But, you know, talking with her today, you can kind of hear why that's a possibility. I mean, people, people during this pandemic in America in particular, I mean, the rich, the rich actually had a great year. You know, people who are the luxury clients had a great year because of the way that the stock market bounced back. You know, for better or worse, that's kind of what happened here in the U.S. And so you can hear that talking with her, that her clients who are extremely wealthy, spending $4,500 and up on wedding gowns, um, were able to still make that purchase on that wedding gown, even though they had a tiny wedding, they still wanted to spend that much money. Um, so it's kind of interesting to hear that. Um, a couple of hands up, Caleb, did you have a comment? can't hear you, although I see your microphone is on. I don't know if you want to throw something in the chat, if you can hear us. Um, Philip, did you have something to say? Uh, yes, I was just going to say, um, working in, because I work in Lux Retail, and yeah. over the course of, like, from the beginning of quarantine up until even now, I think what made a difference because I had a client, she honestly, she did not stop shopping. Like I was consistently helping her the entire time. And I really think it just depends on the position of the person. Um, Cause there's a lot of old money that, you know, a lot of them moved either uh, to their houses in the Hamptons or they went down South. And so for them, you know, with, you know, with Florida not really closing, a lot of them went to Florida. So their buys were, swimwear they were looking for evening and going out because a lot of the uh, restaurants and things were open so that's especially in the beginning that's where a lot of that money was going but now that things are opening back up i've seen a large influx of shopping especially in the lux and retail market um although the style of buy is different like i don't think anyone's really looking for a lot of um like very specialty like extravagant pieces i definitely think that they're looking for um more casual clothes because they're on the go maybe they're going out they want more cocktail things of that nature but um i definitely know that that's definitely been a, a pickup as of late yeah yeah that's great thank you thanks for sharing your insight from uh from where you work um, Caleb's question is, if I had any good resources to learn about pricing, and um, definitely, I could definitely talk your ear off about it, uh, if you want, um, and I actually, later on in the semester, usually do a little bit of a, uh, you know, a very, very high level on how to read a selling report, um, so I can layer into that, talking about how you would roll up your pricing. Um, and how you would figure out your retails when you know how much your costing is. But if you have a question sooner than that, Caleb, I don't know, you know, if you're working on a side project and you want to chat with me, let's let's find some time and I can I can talk you through it pretty quickly. It's not rocket science. I know math always feels intimidating, but it's all it's all pretty straightforward once you get the hang of it. Um, we only have about five minutes left, but I would love to hear from Vasilisa. Uh, yes, I'm here, Professor. So the most uh, important insight from this lesson for me was that um, anytime we see something beautiful that's made by seamstress, by designer, we never, we almost never think that uh, it costs a lot of time, a lot of uh, power and pressure. And when the person uh, tell that 
actually, yes, I sleep three hours a day and yes, I have sleepless night. And uh, even though she has a helpers, uh, she still puts a lot of her personal power into her business. And that's where um, it is, um, for me, it is pretty inspiring because I, I, I see that uh, a person is uh, completely uh, like um, on it and um, put all the um, power and abilities to maintain this business and to keep it going. Um, that was the inside of the lesson. And uh, what I would like to learn about is uh, how to actually set up the whole entire process of the uh, production if you're a small business because um, it seems it seems understandable and easy but uh, there are a lot of details that are actually um, kind of quite uh, um, far away from understanding for me like uh, how, yeah. Um, how yeah um, how many uh, workers you need to hire like uh, how many employees you need and how to kind of uh, have the sense um, how much uh, of the um, of the uh, like product you will produce and compare to how many workers you can hire and also like uh, to don't go crazy buying equipment and then make sure you have enough and you would be you wouldn't be uh like in the middle where you don't have all the necessary stuff and you already bought many things and um like yeah to just start the production going when you're a small business yeah yeah i think that's very, really valid and um you know in a couple of weeks we will have in another designer who is a little bit is geared is trying to gear a little bit more commercially so i think it, and she's very fresh with starting her business so i think it's great we can we can circle back on that question with her as well um but yeah great call out thank you um daria i have you next can you hear me yes okay well it it was uh, like her showroom was beautiful. And I love that she showed us the detail of like the hand stitching on the dresses and stuff and the hand embroidery she mentioned. But honestly, I've been leaning more towards doing commercial work and seeing that like that work up close. I know how much time it takes. I know how much effort and yeah. it's still pushing me towards the commercial side instead of this couture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Um, well, guys, I did not have a time to get to all of you, but I don't want to run over. Uh, if anyone who has not spoken yet wants to shoot me an email with your thoughts, I would love to hear from you. Um, but otherwise, you guys have an awesome spring break, even though I know, you know, no one's probably going anywhere too exotic these days. Um, still take some great time for yourself and do something that you really enjoy. And I will see you in two weeks with Zaida Musa, uh, design director for Betsy Johnson. Should be a great class. So thank you all and see you soon. Thanks so much.